Hello everyone and welcome back to the Jurisprudence Podcast with me, Alex. And me, Charlotte. And Charlotte, what are we doing today? We're talking about a film. Oh, okay. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, sort of a, a different um, formula than usual, because usually we pick a topic and then talk about that topic for an hour and maybe there's news or whatever. Um, but this time I basically got so angry <laughs> at a film that recently came out about a month ago um, that I, within days, wrote the blog post and this episode sort of came out of that. Yes, that's very true. What, what film are we talking about in particular? We're, <laughs> we're talking about Megalopolis. Okay. So for, so for quite a lot of people, because I'm assuming it was a flop... Uh, in terms of in terms of the movie, uh, for, so for quite a lot of people, they don't actually know what Megalopolis is, what it was, who made it, and why they made it. Um, yeah, we funnily enough, we looked this morning, and it's not showing in the cinema anymore. No, um, it came out about a month ago. So, so um, I don't know if that's sort of within the sort of timeline for films not being in the cinema anymore, or that's because it didn't go very well, and it's yeah. decided to they've decided to pull it. But um, so. Um, why don't you tell me first? Because I've also seen it. I was with you when 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 we watched this film uh, with a number of other people. Uh, it wasn't our choice. Just saying. Um, <laughs> but why don't you tell us about what this film is? Okay. Yeah. What's it about? Some of the parallels, and then we'll talk about how we can think about it in terms of critiquing the film and critiquing law generally yes, which yes. is basically what what you what you've done here is you've yeah. sort of drawn the connections between some of the the problems with the film versus the problems with 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 law as well and also problems with the way in which the film is portraying issues in law or issues in philosophy as well generally yeah there there's quite a few levels to this um so first of all megalopolis is billed as francis ford coppola's magnum opus at least that's what my colleague described it as and i think that's pretty apt yeah he had been working on this for about 40 years um steve devitt in the late 70s he really wanted to run with this idea of depicting um the catalinarian conspiracy uh which took place in ancient rome um, within the modern context and sort of um, doing like a, a a rehashing, retelling of the story. Sort of like if anyone's ever seen um, the Romeo and Juliet with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, where they basically set Romeo and Juliet in modern time and there's cars and guns and stuff. Or the um, Macbeth. That's got yes. what's his name in it, yes. where he's in a where he's a chef in a in a restaurant. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, but for those of you who don't know, Francis Ford Coppola is a very successful director. It's very um, good. He makes good, some very good films. Yes, he, he's responsible for the Godfather films, which are some of the best films ever made. Apocalypse Now as well. So he's so he's obviously he's obviously a very successful uh, filmmaker and somebody who was given just free reign to do whatever he wanted with this movie yeah and obviously well if you're a very good filmmaker then you get free reign and obviously whatever happens is it's going to be a good film but that's not necessarily always the case when when <laughs> when when you have um sort of unrestricted unchecked or complete authority over the creation of a movie so uh for me there's like two schools of thought regarding this film the the one avenue is that um he spent so long on it that he sort of it it like bowled up in his head and it became this great big like grand idea that um was all consuming and he just sort of threw in the kitchen sink yes um and like it it just carried it just snowballed over the years he kept adding more and more as new technology came out and you know it had spun around in his head and that and that kind of thing and then the other one is the sort of cynical view that um sort of had this free reign like you say and and that he said well 
I'll just do whatever I want then. Yeah, basically. <laughs> um, and I'm more inclined to go towards the first one. Because mm -hmm. I feel like what I've heard about Francis Ford Coppola as a director, he reckons he he wants to like go outside of the box and and he loves like story writing and and he he loves um sort of developing ideas and, mm -hmm. and conveying a message mm -hmm. and i also had a look at what he was saying about this film because he did like an ask me anything um and he said that you know passion drives what he does and he makes films that he likes to watch and he's got like this um sort of website that shows you know the films that he likes and the films that inspire him and mm -hmm. that kind of thing so i think rather than like self-aggrandization and sort of uh, i am a, a great writer or whatever it's more of just a i love this idea so much that yeah. i want everything in it and I want it to be worth all of the work that I've put into it. It's yeah. sort of how um, I, I ended up perceiving it at the end. Yeah. So why don't we just like talk very briefly about what the film is about. So <laughs> if we, we can. A, if we can. Like, I think that the, the overarching thing that I think we'll both conclude about the film is that it's a bit of a mess. Okay? Yeah. In terms of the... The fact that there's there's sort of like tangents that don't really lead anywhere. There's a whole sort of forty eight minute feeling like exposition yeah. about something that just doesn't actually make any difference to the rest of the film. Yeah. There's a lot of like weird themes that's going on. It's it's all very um, artistic. Yeah. In, in my opinion, and it it has no has no grounding. So, so that's the sort of like descriptive analysis. But why don't you explain sort of the the broad story itself? So the the summary says something to the effect of um, an architect has a grand ambition for the development of a city, and he gets pushback and has to basically fight for creating this d development in the city to sort of improve things. That's like the very vague summary that's given. Mm -hmm. And to an extent, that is how it goes. So the main character, Adam Driver, is uh, Caesar Catalina. He is the aforementioned architect, and he has an idea for like a, a, a utopian... Um, like district of the city that is um built out of a material that he won a nobel prize for for like discovering and creating mm -hmm. um it can basically take on any form it can do anything um it can save lives apparently and um it it basically tracks his like struggle to gain favor in doing so mm -hmm. And it's it starts off weird, yes. Like from it does. from the very beginning, because um, he can stop time, yeah. And that's... that's like the first thing that we see. Yeah, that he he's like stood on the the edge of a building, and he goes, "Time, stop." Yeah, and then, <laughs> and then it does. Yeah. Um, and this is never explained in the film. No, e no, ever. No, it's not. <laughs> um. Like why he's able to stop time no um i guess i i say in in the blog post that it's just sort of a a placeholder for the idea that he's omnipotent or that he um he doesn't stop for anything or he, he he's driven and or or something like that he doesn't obey any of the laws of physics yeah he, he, he not not even they can yeah he's got his own agenda yeah and exactly he does what he wants and everything sort of bends around his will mm -hmm. which is an interesting concept um except it isn't really used very well no. and and we we find that with a lot of it that the the concepts that are sort of shoehorned into the film don't mm -hmm. really go anywhere meaningful uh yeah. which is very frustrating to me because 
the thing that made me think about this film so long is that there are interesting ideas that could have gone somewhere but didn't mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and and it was it was very painful um i would just like to yeah to, yeah. Add, to add, add to that point is that there is a lot of parallels between this like between like sort of modern day problems mm -hmm. or seemingly modern day problems and and things going on in this world and you we, you make the point of the sort of um there's a point where he gets uh, 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 accused of of uh, uh, of statutory rape of a of a young of a vest what are they called vesta vestal virgin vestal virgin so yeah um what I I should probably explain that it, because it's based on the historic um Catalinarian conspiracy there's like a a a modern day sort of ancient Rome mix mash yeah so, so it, it in, like, in yeah. this like middle section that you say nothing really happens they're in a coliseum and i don't know they're having like a great big party because this um bank owner gets married yeah. to a tv presenter um and it's set in a a, a a gladiatorial stadium and then there's a middle section where this vestal virgin um representative sort of sells off her virginity um yeah or like not she, she she doesn't sell her virginity she's like asking for pledges yeah to, to carry her, on yes <laughs> which yeah. is also weird well there's a few there's a few interesting parallels that i thought with with that yeah but the, the first thing is that essentially that yeah they 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 are i feel like what what i read into that particular bit where they're all they're all pledging money they're all doing the highest bidding mm -hmm. for to keep her virginity or whatever um it felt like sort of like the kind of parallels that you can draw with with religion mm -hmm. the idea that this whole society has devoted so much value to something that is seemingly so surface level and so valueless yeah to the point where when it comes out that she is allegedly had sex allegedly have is not a virgin everything collapses and they all start to riot and they all yeah. start to like fight each other and it's like this is like a sort of thin veneer of of stability over this over this uh over like this meaningless thing. yeah a meaningless thing and so we will make the connection to that and religion the fact that religion was seen as something that kept everything together mm. uh, but was so was so sort of thin in terms of its meaning such that like once that collapses then then what else happens and it's yeah. you can sort of draw that to sort of the the kind of um the kind of uh, marxist principle of religion being the opium of the people the sort right. of subduing of of society and this is like this idea here is that oh if we all give money to this thing to this concept no matter what this concept is everything will be okay but then because it's so service level and so meaningless that um it causes everyone everything to collapse when it when it is revealed that it's broken to bits if that yeah. makes sense that's the first point that i i, I thought was quite interesting the, the second point this is a, a critique my first critique is that basically what happens here is you have the what they call vestal virgins yeah the vestal virgin was uh you know it was revealed or whatever there was a video that she had that she had not been a virgin that she had slept with somebody else and it was played in front of everybody our, our main character no less yeah our main character had sex with this virgin and the and then there's a there's a whole hoo-ha he gets arrested and all this kind of stuff yeah. and then it turns out that it was just a deep fake ai in, uh, video wasn't it yeah not only was it a deep fake um but uh the other main character goes and finds her like birth certificate randomly and she says aha yeah she's 23 she's not 16 yeah so so not only was she not underage it also never happened yeah and it's and that and i thought well that's an interesting parallel to the dangers that ai like, yes. can can face in in the world and and the fact that we are seeing deep fakes uh, more and more and the fact that we are seeing misinformation growing more and more we've got an election in a week in america yes. that's just a swimming pool of uh, of misinformation at the moment and it was meaningless it, it did yeah. nothing to the film it yeah. was an interesting concept that could have been 
explored more, thinking about society, we're thinking about utopian society, we're thinking quite outside the box here, and obviously Francis Paul Coppola has, has identified this issue as being one of quite significant um, prevalence mm -hmm. and, and quite significant difficulty, and yet it doesn't go anywhere. That's, yeah. that's just, that, that exposition ends and then we move on to something else. It He gets arrested and then like moments later it cuts to a scene where a news anchor is saying, oh, don't worry, guys, it actually never happened. Yeah. Um, everyone can calm down. So uh, half of me is like, well, that was utterly pointless and said nothing mm -hmm. at all. And the other half of me thinks that that in itself could be a commentary on how we get absolutely outraged over seemingly meaningless things. and then swiftly move on to the next thing and then you could even say it's a commentary on the fact that things happen and nobody really pays attention to it for very long yeah like news stories will just keep going and going and so the news cycle will just continue yeah. and it will never end and never stop no matter how big the story is it might last a little bit longer but then a new, a new thing happens yeah exactly yeah that's very true so so there's some quite you know up there high level thinking ideas that we mm -hmm. can talk about and i'm sure we'll do some more what what kind of law related issues or things do you want to mention well i think the the thing that enthralled me the most was the kind of transition scene where catalina goes to um i'm assuming it's his old house or something like that mm -hmm. and his wife that was killed um is there somehow um but she isn't she's dead um i don't really understand that scene but um yeah i forgot about that scene yeah the, they don't they don't explain that scene do they no no, no. the <laughs> the other main <laughs> the the other main character follows him on his journey to wherever that is it's julia isn't it yeah um the mayor's daughter julia yeah, yeah. and they go through like the rough areas of the city and I guess it's sort of trying to demonstrate that while there's all this like hedonistic rich lifestyle we just saw was this before the the gladiatorial scene yes 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 um so the parallels between people struggling and the the rich um sort of fighting over meaningless things and that kind of thing um is also really interesting. So we see this dilapidated area of the city and it's raining, um, everything's dirty. Um, Lady Justice is personified and slumping against a building. Um, there's kind of, it seems to be that crime is happening in this area, like people are running around and it looks a little bit like chaotic. Um, and it struck me that this is a very typical depiction of like struggle or, yeah. or like people are being failed in this society. Mm -hmm. You kind of saw it in Joker as well uh, a few years ago. Um, that, yeah. That there were like rough areas of the city. Um, he was beaten up and, and, and that kind of thing. I mean, like, the broader theme of Joker, the movie is that, you know, it wasn't, like, to what extent is it truly all his fault that he does all the things that he does, yeah. isn't it? And he talks about, and he talks about that with Robert De Niro on, on, in the film, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's sort of a, a commentary on the idea of justice, the idea of a just society, mm -hmm. the idea of all of these things not really fitting together. But interestingly the, the the thing that i wanted to talk about i don't know if you've got any other points you want to make oh, I was, talk about it i was just gonna say really quickly that um it's interesting that julia follows um catalina through this thing and and she's like shocked by what she sees right mm. because she's the mayor's daughter and she lives this life of hedonism she's a party animal yeah she goes like clubbing and stuff the mayor by the way who who hates the main character who yeah. hates the idea of meg megalopolis who hates the idea of a utopian yeah. society who's gonna block any chances of that 
of his project becoming a, a real thing. Yeah, yeah, he's like the brick wall to um, the development that Catalina wants to do. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll get on to that in a minute. Um, yeah, basically, the, she she is like... I don't know if she's supposed to be representative of our eyes, that we're shocked that there's such a, a dichotomy going on in the city, or if we're supposed to see her like develop and realize that um people are struggling or i i'm i'm not really sure but um i just thought it was very interesting that it was meant to be shocking but it was also like very a, a very like amateurish depiction of quite obvious themes yeah to me yeah it felt quite surface level didn't it yeah. everything felt surface level everything felt like it could have been explored in a bit more detail yeah uh, but the sort of like the fact that it seems he wanted to just shoehorn in as much as possible mm -hmm. it, it, it nothing really got the right amount of airtime so the ai conversation yeah didn't really go anywhere it didn't get much didn't get much airtime the sort of riots that happened towards the end of the film where yes. they went to the mayor's, ha mayor's house and they tried to overthrow the mayor and it and there was very much um similar language and rhetoric that you can make comparisons between that and the january 6th riots yes. uh, following uh, or the january 6th insurrection so they say uh following um donald trump's speech uh when they were trying to um, certify the election uh in 2021 there's 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 a parallel there's clear parallels there there's like the very similar language that is used yes um Shia LaBeouf's character who sort of incites this insurrection um it says things like you need to fight like hell which mm -hmm. is obviously very similar uh, not very similar sorry I'll I'll be more clear exactly the same language that yeah. that, that Donald Trump uses in the insurrection uh, when he well when he incites an insurrection and so you think okay there's some interesting brief um broad themes that are going on there there's nice parallels between between coppola uh, understanding that and thinking about the january 6th insurrection this is a film that came out a couple of months before the the election yes that's happening uh, next week um next week the week after next week shall i say um francis Ford coppola is a, a, a seemingly a democrat has helped democratic candidates in the past in yeah. terms of his political activism and then nothing Yes. And then it's sort of like, oh, the insurrection or the riots have been quashed. Nothing happens. Nothing else. It's just sort of like a 10, 15 minute bit of exposition yeah. that goes nowhere again. Well, the, the the character that Shia LaBeouf plays is actually probably the most interesting and the most underused character in the whole film. Yeah. Because he, for whatever reason, he's like Julia's cousin. Or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think. I believe. Um, and he makes it his mission to mess with Catalina. And I don't, I don't exactly remember for why. I think, I don't know, he wants, he wants the power, he wants the money, or something like that. I don't know, you know. I feel like that's <laughs> not even the, the case. I don't think no. there was any sort of power craze that came from that because he was the son of the guy who owns the bank wasn't yeah. he yeah he want he wanted the bank really did he though i thought it was the newsreader lady who well yeah she did she wanted the bank and she coerced him into helping her get the bank yeah i i don't remember <laughs> I, honestly that's that's the sort of that's the kind of it's very unclear but anyway yeah. he he like basically does the little um conflict subplots he's sort of the the foil where he makes things go wrong he's also he's also the sort of the the the, the fascistic character yes in the sense that he sort of stirs up the 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 well, rioters yeah. he he's the one that sort of um in imbues a certain degree of disdain and hatred towards certain people mm -hmm. um he, he sort of uses quite fascistic rhetoric in terms of when he does his speeches and all this kind of stuff well this is what i was getting at so he he is responsible for the deep fake that was displayed of yes. catalina having sex with uh vesta um is responsible for the sort of 
rioting and, and agitation of the public. And his interaction with the public is actually the most interesting to me because he goes to these struggling areas of the city and has his like lackey with him and he basically says these people are desperate we're going to buy them yeah and and curry their favor um for what end i'm not sure he just wants to to get power over other actors in the film yeah potentially um but he he literally passes out money to them yeah um in order to do so and i think this this depiction of desperate people in the film is the most interesting to me um because this happens um he gains like a following that it, it just basically is a mob it's it's a mob following that sort of blows with whatever he says mm -hmm. and um he's got his megaphone out and He's he's saying, you know, um, the the people in power don't care about you. No, yeah. Um, they're trying to build this part of the city that is just it's dangerous. We don't know what this material megalon does. Um, they're using you as a, um guinea pigs to like experiment experiment on you, but they're mm -hmm. not actually helping you. This kind of thing. Um, and then. All conspiratorial conspiratorial yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and all of this whips up and um then dies down like they they start their sort of insurrection rioting um and then all of the main characters get on a train and we have a little conversation and then they're like oh by the way the riot's over yeah that yeah, actually happens yeah there's nothing there's nothing to it there's nothing to it at but all. then our um main character adam driver uh catalina after he's built his big, weird, mushroom-shaped buildings of the future out of his megalon substance, um, goes and addresses the people, um, standing on one of them, and says something to the effect of, uh, you can achieve if you dream, and if you think outside of the box, and and you are you have the power within you, and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. to these people that have been manipulated throughout the film and actually aren't reaping any of the benefits of um improvement of the city yet but then somehow they're suddenly placated by these words of this omnipotent um all-powerful um nothing can touch him not even the law not even you know, uh, conflict within the movie. Yeah. Has everything that he wants. Yeah, basically. <laughs> um, and and all of a sudden everything is fine and everyone's happy, and then the movie ends. Yes. Yeah. That's that, exactly. That's what exactly what happens. So, that that brings us nicely to a point that I wanted to raise about the sort of perception of utopia. Yeah. In in terms of in terms of this movie, because. From what I understand, there's this sort of this megalos substance material or whatever mm -hmm. that's that's been discovered that he's won a Nobel Prize for that's going to change the world and all this, and you and you get to see it in at various different stages. Um, there's the suggestion that it isn't anything at the beginning mm. when he's showing um, is it Julia where he's basically got like random pieces of furniture and, and then garbage and garbage and stuff and and she's she's he's asking her to close her eyes and walk through it and she can then imagine this whole world and this whole universe or whatever yeah. of, of utopia so it's almost like it's a completely meaningless thing it's just made up it's it's yeah, not real it, thinking outside the box creates utopia yeah exactly is basically the the message but then but then that's the message, but then there is actually genuine things that happen. There's like he makes a travelator, which is apparently utopia, and they have of... those at airports. Yeah, exactly. I don't understand, <laughs> but the idea. But the thing is, that's quite interesting what you said that that thinking outside the box is is the sort of utopian principle. Mm -hmm. But it, he doesn't seem to think very much outside of the box, and it made me think of a book by uh, Mark Fisher uh, called Capitalist Realism. Mm. 
the idea that essentially we can imagine basically anything but we can't imagine the end of capitalism. Yeah. The question is, is there no alternative? Which is sort of a spin on Margaret Thatcher's uh, speech about the, the the market and neoliberalism being There's... the only alternative, or there is no alternative. There's no such thing as society. Yeah, well, yeah, as well. And it is very interesting that we're talking about this idea of utopia. We're talking about all of this and talk about how we can think outside the box and how it's all um, it, it's all very uh, abstract and extracted. But we're still doing this within the confines of uh, the uh, what's his name? Catalina owning a company, being yeah. the CEO of a corporation that yeah. is going to that's going to build this society um, that's being bankrolled by um, uh, a bank billionaire owner. And, and there's the, all of the owner class and all this kind of stuff. So it's like we can imagine everything in our utopian society, but our utopian society does not do away with the idea of capitalism. Yeah. I think it's quite interesting, given that, given that fundamentally, um, Francis Ford Coppola had the 40 years to think about what a utopian society would look like in his mind and how it was going to get represented on the screen. And the best he could do was some travelators... And uh, weird fluidy buildings. Weird fluidy buildings, exactly. And there was there was nothing really else to it. And if the if the deep message is the utopia is whatever you can think of, and it's actually that that first bit where she's just walking around a a, a seemingly innocuous room with mm -hmm. a sofa and a chair and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And she has to close her eyes and imagine it, then it seems quite it seems quite disappointing that the imagination doesn't go any further than the basic confines of 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 the capitalist society that we live in which yes. is quite interesting well it, that's interesting it's interesting that the characters are very unimaginative when it comes to the u utopia that they're creating and also you're saying that um Coppola's imagination as to what utopia is mm -hmm. after 40 years of thinking about it is uh very it's, unimaginative it's very, it's very surface level it also is quite interesting that within this utopian society the the scene that you saw with the with the sort of decrepit collapsing breaking mm -hmm. down of society and the sort of the sort of backwaters of the city if you yeah. will and the fact that lady justice is sort of collapsing and all this kind of stuff is not thought about as being addressed in this utopian society. Well, these are problems of policy, right? Yeah. The injustice and the fact that people are homeless and, and struggling, these are policy matters. Mm -hmm. And yet they're seemingly going to be solved by an architect building a new district with a nice park and travelators. Yeah, yeah um, exactly. So... And they're systemic. Yes, exactly. So the the idea of utopia and this whole um, exposition about you need to think outside the box and and trust the process and yeah. and dream big, um, and we don't need to live in a world of realism. We can sort of strive towards the ideal, um, and and that's the only way we're going to improve. Is confined by material things. It's confined by money when his bank is stopped yeah um it's confined by the material that he's made and is building buildings out of yeah um and it's also confined by the sort of the the stopping of time and and this like use of this power that he has i'd also add that it's confined by the idea of it being only achievable through the genius of a single eccentric billionaire yes the kind of elon musk yes comparisons that you can make where um i believe um someone's speaking about elon musk saying that um he's he wants to be the one to save the world or he's happy he wants the world to be saved but only if he can be the one to do it mm -hmm. which i think is what somebody says about elon musk 
um and the way he sort of like conceives of himself as a sort of centric billionaire genius who does all these things he's like iron man everyone mm -hmm. everyone thinks he's like iron man for some reason and all this kind of stuff he, he built tesla he built spacex and all this kind of thing and it is kind of like only one man can save us from uh, this from this from this ongo from this you know destruction or whatever only one man can deliver us this idea of utopia yeah and it's a sort of god complex that, that that he has and it's almost like he is a god in this film and and that's an interesting uh connection that i just thought of right now uh, well yeah exactly <laughs> it's only towards the end that the people are invoked into this conversation about what a utopian society would look like yeah um and they're encouraged to also do a similar thing to um you know think outside the box and and dream what they want and that kind of thing but there's no policy in place such that they're able to do that no well there's, it's nothing's it, fundamentally changed for these people yeah well it, it begs the question like what does utopia even look like because he he his conception of utopia is uh thinking outside the box and like having some weird squid world yeah <laughs> mushrooms yeah. or travel agents or whatever and i don't know if that's just a, a, a like a sort of physical depiction of what he like a, of, of a utopia it's almost like that's a placeholder it's like that's mm. not actually what utopia looks like mm. but for the purposes of this arty farty movie that's all about rome and all about yeah. all this kind of stuff we're just gonna use that as a thing where it's like okay that's that's the utopia bit that, yes. we're, that we're looking at um but it does beg the question what does utopia look like and the answer to that question probably isn't a material thing it's probably a lot more abstract yeah it is the 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 solving of systemic issues mm -hmm. it is things that you don't necessarily see and people think sort of look at utopia and they think well look at the you know the the roads are all broken or there's litter everywhere or you've got homelessness a utopia wouldn't have that and it's like okay well then that, that's great but but what what are the steps necessary to solve that yeah and the steps necessary to solve those problems aren't things that you can solve with some material or even necessarily you can solve with some money yeah it's something that you can sort you have to solve by doing quite a lot of deep policy changes and quite a lot of um quite important introspection as a society and as a state and and thinking about and thinking about how you actually address these systemic challenges it is possible that you can glean that from this movie in a sense of if you if you take like the broad ideas around the struggle towards creating this utopian district mm -hmm. if you think that it's not about the buildings themselves but rather the the struggle and the steps that it took to get there mm -hmm. then you can kind of extrapolate the idea that it's about um you know being willing to take a chance and um sort of encouraging people to um not worry about the now but kind of what what they need and what they expect from a, a better society and that mm -hmm. kind of thing um but i think because there's so much emphasis placed on the constraints of material things mm -hmm. that that's really hard to get out of the movie. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things we said when we were walking home from seeing this movie is that it feels like it's going to be the kind of movie that in a few weeks time or a few months time or even a few years time, someone's going to write an essay about how it's actually genius mm. and how, uh, and how you have to be, you know, really intelligent. You have to think outside the box yourself to really get what, what, what Francis Ford Coppola was actually trying to get at here. And, it's the kind of um, Rick and Morty um, yes. paradigm where, uh, for those of you who don't know, Rick and Morty is a TV show, a sort of cartoon show for, for adults, and is basically a bit like um, Back to the Future, essentially, yeah. but a bit more crazy. And one of the things that you sort of... One of the things that's sort of the message within some of the early Rick and Morty episodes is this idea of, of nihilism, the idea of universal nihilism, the idea that things, nothing exists, nothing matters, you know, the universe is so big and you are so small. And there's, there's sort of, also multiple universes. Yeah, there's more, there's, it's a multiverse and all this kind of stuff. There's lots of you. Yeah, yeah. and, and, it, and, it, and it, it 
very, I would say it very, 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 very briefly brushes on very surface level issues of existentialist philosophy. Mm -hmm. However, there is a certain collection of Rick and Morty fans who sort of go with the idea that you have to be 197 IQ to be able to understand Rick and Morty and only yeah. truly intelligent people know what they're talking about and all this kind of stuff, which is obviously not true. It's obviously bollocks, okay? But <laughs> um, but I feel like the same kind of thing might happen here. And I feel like we're probably contributing to that by doing an episode talking about the sort of deep-seated meaning behind Megalopolis, where you go, actually, you need to be very intelligent to understand this. And you have to, and it's sort of very highbrow and all this kind of ridiculous ideas and yeah. notions of of, uh, of of philosophy and abstract ideas and the fact that we're academics means that we're allowed to think about these things and able to think about these things, but most people don't think about these things because mm. it doesn't matter to their lives. So I think that's also a really interesting point, though, because um, to what extent is media a, a way of talking to people? Mm. And if you are creating a film for public consumption, yes. just like general, go to the cinema and you can see it. Is this the way that the messages Coppola wanted to portray? Um, the best way to do it yeah uh, and i would say absolutely not it, there's yeah. no way that the average person is going to watch the film and come away with a better understanding of how we can think about utopia and how we think about power and um like but is that the point and, what, what and was... social commentary and that kind of thing what what was what was his rationale what was his raison d'etre to actually make this film did, um, did, did, did... i read something to the the effect of he wanted to talk about um use of power uh, or the the responsibilities um regarding power of a few men so this idea of the the world is run by very powerful people and how they like manage that power yeah. Um, and 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 that kind of thing. But yeah, he doesn't do that. No. Uh, no. I was gonna say. I was to be fair. <laughs> I, when I asked the question just there, what was his intentions? I actually don't think it matters what answer you would have given me because there is no answer that you can give me where I will go. Oh, okay. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, I can see. I can. Yeah, I really get why what he was getting at there because yeah. any answer you give me, if it's a commentary on power, it does a bad job of showing that. Yeah. If it's a commentary on utopia. It's a bad job about uh, on that. If it's a commentary about social discontent and injustice, it's a, a bad. It's a very bad. It, if it is, it's oh, it's just a fun movie with interesting visuals and a nice story. That's also terrible. Yeah, no, there's nothing about that either. The visuals, I I, call, I um described it as a a cinematic heartburn. Like it yeah. makes you feel sick because there's so much going on. Yeah. We haven't even talked about the visuals, but it's insane. Yeah. Um it actually feels like you're tripping at yeah. points. Um <laughs> and I suppose that really captures the the kind of abstract, nonsensical um kind of feel that he wanted to give the film. But like you just said, everything that it tries to do um, in the format that it was intended for, which is just average cinematic viewing, it does a terrible job. I think I would also add that, like, the fact that we've spent 40 minutes talking about this, talking about some of the, the deeper themes that you can sort of maybe glean from it, mm -hmm. might not say anything about the, the quality of the movie, because I feel like when you have such abstract ideas and such nonsense, anyone can read anything into anything. You almost have to because you want to make sense of what you've just seen. Yeah, in a, in a sort of which is what I've done <laughs> in the sort of the 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 way in which humans are sort of uh, have the experience of sort of pareidolia, where mm. they see patterns in in various in various different you know bits of noise that's seemingly random. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You you want to try and find patterns in in things, but that does beg the question of does this fall into the category of some nonsense? that people have read into mm. that we can just read anything into like any there's sort of i'm trying to think of an example of like that sort of philosophy that is nonsense 
that I'm not sure, but what came to mind was have you ever listened to those um like AI generated voices where if you focus on one form of the word, it sounds like one thing. And if you focus yeah, on yeah, it, it's like yeah. the Laurel Yanny yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it reminds me of. I was going to go a bit, I was going to go a bit more. I was thinking, you know, David Firth. Yes. The person who makes like salad fingers yes. and all those other really weird things. They're seemingly nonsense. Yes. And they are, they are nonsense. Okay. But you go into the comment section of any of those videos and you'll probably find people talking about how oh, this represents such deep, interesting um, existentialist ideas and, 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 and principles and, and things about society and what, what they say about ourselves and the mind and the person. And I feel like this is similar to that. And it's similar to Rick and Morty in that sense, because the creators of Rick and Morty will say, no, this is just a fun TV show that's kind of funny and yeah. got a scientist that's a, that's a drunk scientist and there's no there's no deep meaning behind it. But anybody on a Reddit page on Rick and Morty will tell you, oh, you have to be really clever, you have to be intelligent, all these abstract ideas are sort of baked into this. I think um, this is made a little bit worse than that, because obviously um, Coppola had artistic intent behind it. Yeah. So he he had a message that he wanted to imbue the film with. Yeah. And he had ideas around um linking it to um the historic like usurping of power mm -hmm. and how that is portrayed in historic texts. I don't know how like deep into it he wanted to go because I didn't read like a a memoir of why he made the film or whatever, yeah. but I'm sort of assuming. Um so there is some kind of philosophy behind the film mm -hmm. which makes it even easier to read in these kinds of messages and symbolism and stuff and you could almost go shot by shot and say what did he mean by this what why did he decide to do that that's also a good point that there's things in there that are seemingly innocuous and that have no relevance and there probably are things that are innocuous and have no relevance. And so the the task for somebody who wants to read into this film, like us, is to try and discern meaning from things that might or might not have any meaning at all. Yeah. But then that also begs a deeper question of what what does it matter? If Francis Paul Coppola says, if I if we picked out a point, let's say, in the film and we go, look, this could symbolize this and mean this and mean that, if Francis Paul Coppola comes out and says, No, I don't that's not my intention at all. No. I, I it was just a I had the broad idea, and then I yeah. just what, ran what, with it. What does that matter? Why yeah. does the Why does the creator get to have the complete unadulterated license to to be able to dictate what meaning should be derived out of their work? If we can derive meaning ourselves, then so yeah. What, what does it matter that he says no? This is that's not true. You're talking rubbish. I think that's a really good point because to what extent is a piece of art or writing or whatever a dialogue between the person that creates it and the pe people who sort of see it and digest it yeah exactly and um it goes back to my original point which was as a film for people it does a terrible job of communicating um in any meaningful way yeah which goes to the sort of broad tangential link that I made to academic writing, mm -hmm. um, which is when you write a piece of um, commentary on mm -hmm. an issue or or analyze a law or whatever. Yeah. Um, you have to think about who your audience is. What area yeah. are you trying to speak to? Are you trying to speak to human rights lawyers and what they will have to say on mm -hmm. something? Or are you trying to speak to philosophers and use the language of the people that you have in mind in order to convey your message? Because what I was told by my supervisor in a recent supervision is if someone has to ask you what you mean, that is an indictment on you as a writer. Oh, a hundred percent. And this is a problem that this is a problem that is it permeates academia. Yeah. Especially when you're thinking about theory. Yeah. When we think about jurisprudential theory, when we talk about, uh, for you, it's criminal theory. For me, it would be international legal theory. Um, these things are 
pervasive in academia the idea of just being being able to just sort of write whatever you want Mm -hmm. and you you shouldn't feel that you should feel the need to have to explain your points the problem is is that yeah like 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 your supervisor said like if you if someone doesn't understand it then you've done a a bad job of explaining it yeah it's a there's an interesting um sort of method that i don't know if it was i don't know if it was sort of like um coined by by richard feynman but it's at least known as the feynman method feynman was obviously a, a very famous particle physicist um but he says that if you can't explain a concept in your own words to another person such that they understand that concept then you don't understand the concept yourself yeah and we if we think for example i don't know let's take take a mathematical principle take like integration and calculus all right how if you were to explain that concept knowing your relationship with maths okay <laughs> yeah you you would probably explain that concept in a way that i probably wouldn't understand no maybe you know you would you would explain how to do the process of this that and the other yeah but somebody else might explain the concept more abstractly in a way that in their own words where they start talking about okay well what are we trying to do when we integrate under a curve what are the kind of the, the ways in which we could um find an estimate for for the for the area of various different um uh, rectangles under a curve well, okay what well, if we took an infinite number of those rectangles and then took a sum of those and took mm. a limit and all this kind of stuff and so the point here is that if you can't explain a concept in your own words such that somebody else understands it, then you don't understand it your, yourself. It's the, yeah. fi- the Feynman method, and that seems to ha- that seems to permeate academia. A hundred percent. Um, it seems that people obfuscate their points to in in like more ideas and and more sort of terminology longer and, words and, and yeah in order to hide the fact that they don't have any answers yeah and i think the scariest part about writing in academia is the fact that often you're limited to say like 12,000 words you might have a a problem that is worth a heck of a lot more than 12,000 words Mm -hmm. and yet you have to have a beginning middle and end which sort of talks about the problem addresses it in some way and then summarizes and I think that that's really hard yeah that's really hard I mean it's hard for me because I've been working on the same article for about a year yeah and uh the the problem sort of it sticks with you and it runs around in your head and you're like, Oh, I could add this or I could talk about that. And this is next to the problem. I should probably take it in because it expands more on what I'm trying to say about the issue. And then by the end of it, you've got like 50,000 words that you could say about this thing and narrowing in on the beginning, middle and end. That is actually what your 12,000 words are supposed to say and explain is very hard yeah and and i feel like that's a thing in fact that for those of you who are watching who are law students you probably don't you probably won't get that experience in a in a, in a law problem because with a problem question all you're tasked with is identifying the the issue that you're being asked about identifying the correct law explain that correct law and then apply that law to the situation in the problem question and it's written to be within the confines of the question itself. Exactly. So it will only ever take yeah. you. Exactly. If it's like, if it's like, uh, I don't know. Uh, and often the problem questions resemble a case that you would have studied anyway. Yes. So it's like, I don't know, you know Barry witnesses a, 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 a bus rolling down a hill and he hears a child that he thinks might be his. And you think, well, this is just a case that we've already, we've yeah. already, we already know. Yeah. And we just apply that case already. This is why I like to just, whenever I'm writing things, I try and stick to just the, the most doctrinal questions possible. Yes. Especially like in IHL or whatever. Was this target lawful? Okay, well, we apply additional protocol one, we apply the meaning of here, we apply the, the meaning of precautions and taking feasible measures, okay, and blah, 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 yes or no. It, it likely was or likely wasn't. Mm-hmm. But the more abstract theoretical problems become a problem. Yes. They become a megalopolis. 
I think that's why this film stuck with me so much is because yeah. I went away and I thought, oh my god. Lacadinia. This, this is this is my PhD. <laughs> oh <laughs> this, no. <laughs> this is what it could become yeah. if I, if you're not careful. Yeah. Because you you get wrapped up in the idea and it consumes you. Yeah. And at the end of the, at the end of your 40 years or 4 years or however long you spend on it, if you don't say, right, this is what I'm setting out to do. Mm -hmm. This is the main plot or narrative that I want to convey. And the, these are the distinct points that I want people to get out of it. Um, you will never have a coherent message. No. And I genuinely believe that um, Coppola did not do that. Yeah. When he was storyboarding or whatever, it just... I, I'm imagining like papers everywhere and like scribbles in twenty different notebooks and yeah and yeah. Well, it speaks as well to a critique I have of the idea of a PhD in general. Yeah, and taking the the quote from uh, another famous physicist, Freeman Dyson, who doesn't have a PhD. It's the idea of spending at least at least three or four years of your sort of early academic career condemned in his words to a single problem yeah condemned to a single question where when in reality academia isn't a single question academia is your academic career is going to be involving yourself in lots of different problems lots of different questions lots of different research work and i don't know if the phd program the idea of you know postgraduate research is uh, particularly conducive to making good academics, but that's a broader critique that I that I have. Well, yeah. Um, something someone said recently that was quite interesting is um the way some academics approach answering questions is they'll write an article, um that sort of ekes their way a little bit closer to what they're actually trying to say, and you start at the beginning of your career and write your 12,000 words of an article and it says a little bit and then your next article draws on that first article and says a little bit more and you sort of breadcrumb your way into what you're actually trying to say but that's not because that's a good thought process though is it that's because the the nature of academia is that you have to publish articles well i mean you could have a cynical view of it um and and say that but i feel like wouldn't it be better if you spent, you know, time working on lots of different topics and lots of different questions mm. and finding an area that you believe is your area that you want to, 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 to work on rather than just starting in an area that you're condemned to work in for, well, no, for, for I, a long period of time? I, I think it's it's less about that and more the the iterative process of developing ideas and and recognizing the confines of um what you can do in one piece of writing potentially 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 um i mean being condemned to one question is painful and i wouldn't recommend it to anyone <laughs> but if you're genuinely interested in sort of a small area and you do your little breadcrumbing around that area until you finally hit the bullseye on what you're actually trying to get at. Yeah. I think that is a good process of academic writing. Potentially. It, like tweaking the knobs of the thought experiment, so mm -hmm. to speak. Yeah. Um, but if you're sort of beaten and dragged through a bush for four years, um, having to answer the uh, a question that you thought of when you were 21, yeah. <laughs> then it's a little bit different. Yeah. Well, um, and, and to sort of round up the um, the episode, I ended up complaining about uh doing a PhD. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah, exactly. Well, I thought that was quite good. I thought yeah. it was. Uh, I I would recommend anybody go watch the movie. I actually would recommend people watch the movie so that they can just know how crazy it is. Just uh, just have a bit of fun. It's not on Amazon Prime yet. Looking at it, but it it probably will be eventually. It only has just 
been released. It only released like a month ago in cinemas. So yeah. Um, let us know if you've actually watched the movie yourself. I don't. I don't imagine many people will have. Um, no. But I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Anything else you want to add? Um, it's got a five on IMDb. Yeah, a five on IMDb. Which make is make of that what you will. Oddly higher than I thought it would be. Um, and I would also like to say that although I did just complain a little bit about um doing a PhD, it sort of ties more broadly into thinking very carefully about um the sort of uh creative journeys that you embark on and the processes that are involved and um learning and developing as a writer yes um as much as i struggle i actually quite am i'm i'm quite glad that i'm doing a phd yes but, of course um yeah, just for anyone any any birds out there that are listening in on me Ever. Or, just, or just generally, or just, just generally, generally, or just generally, anyone who might have thought, "Oh, I might want to do," academia. and then they hear this and they're and like, like, "Oh, no, I'm not doing that." Charlotte doesn't like it. Yeah, no, okay. I, I, yeah, exactly. Right. Well, I think that's everything. Yeah. So uh, I hope everyone's enjoyed. Um, I hope everybody stays tuned for the next episode where we're going to be talking about a little bit more concrete legal concepts we'll yeah, be well, talking about complementarity in the icc back to the regularly scheduled business this was a little bit of fun yeah the regularly scheduled israel palestine conversation yeah um, <laughs> which is alex's remit yeah um so yeah i hope everybody's enjoyed it stay tuned for the next episode again let us know if you have seen the film what you thought of the film what themes you thought we missed um or if you haven't seen the film, like I said, go and go and watch it when you can and come back and, and tell us what you thought yeah. of it. Um, so, and yeah. Let us know if you want any more just sort of wax lyrical episodes, because this was actually quite fun. Yeah, about a movie that is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe we'll pick a, a good film yeah, next time. With, with deeper themes and all yeah. this kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, we could do Apocalypse Now. Yeah, potentially. Um, which is another Coppola film, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, this just slowly turns into a, a movie podcast because <laughs> there's not there's not enough of those around, is oh, there? Oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so yeah, stay tuned for the next episode. <laughs>